fishers of men, builders of people. And I just want to take a chance to, to share a quick testimony with you as we start this uh, part two here. I, you know, sometimes we, I think in our mind, we've already made it impossible to fish for souls, to disciple people, to build people up, because we've made it impossible in our mind before we ever even begin. And um, the truth is, is that if you'll follow some simple steps we're going to share with you, if you'll listen to this teaching, part one, part two, let it gestate. Listen to it a few times. Let it marinate in your heart. Let it come alive inside you. Let the anointing on it affect the way you think. Uh, let that spiritual process take place. I think you'll see that it's, it's really more like fish in a barrel. Uh, it's really like, a, you know, we say a turkey shoot. It may, much more easier than we think it is. Let me give an example. Um, I, when I was first church planting uh, down in Florida a few years ago, I had some guys uh, from my hometown come down, and, and we were hanging out, people I had been investing in, that type of thing, uh, time, talent, treasure in a spiritual way. And, uh, you know, I just, uh, I thought, well, l let me take these guys to the movie. You know, all, all work and no play makes Jack a dull boy. And so we, I didn't have a vehicle at the time. Down here, it's like a little New York. I mean, you take the bus or sidewalk, you can get anywhere like that bicycle trails, um, you know, and I was trying to lose weight, trying to get in shape and all that kind of thing. And so I wasn't really, you know, my hair wasn't on fire to get, to get something like that. Uh, obviously it's not that way now, but, uh, so we took the bus, uh, down to the movie theater a few miles down the road and I had like a couple extra dollars in my pocket, more than the bus fare, you know, needed. And as we're standing there waiting on the bus, the, uh, the spirit of God inside of me spoke up and said, why don't you offer a dollar to that fella standing right there next to you? Total stranger, big guy, and of another ethnicity, and, uh, you know, maybe a bit of a fierce countenance, you know, on his look there. And But and nevertheless, I just want to listen to the Holy Spirit and be used of God. So I said to this gentleman, I said, sir, could, um, could I offer you this dollar? You know, the bus ride was $2, and so that's half his fare right there. And it's, it's, it's always good to sow seed, you know. And so this guy said, oh, yeah, thank you so much. And so he seemed positive. He received that dollar. And so I thought, well, there's an, open, an opening right there. And uh, so I said, well, you know, I'm, I'm planting a church in the area, and these are some of my friends. We had just gone to the movie. And I just kind of introduced myself to him. And he says, oh, wow. He says, um, you know, you're you're a pastor. I said, well, yeah, yeah, we're 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 working on a church right now, actually. And uh, he says, well, I got a question. And I said, okay. And he says, now this is a guy I've never met. We're just at a bus stop, okay? We're not in a church service. We're not in a prayer line. We're we're just at a bus stop. And he says, you know, I've been in the Marines. I've been all over the earth. I've traveled. I've seen everything I could possibly see. He says, but there's one question I just haven't found an answer to. And he says, I want to know how to get to heaven when I die. I almost fell over backwards on the floor when he said that, and right there on the concrete parking lot, I was like, did he just ask me how to get to heaven over a dollar? I mean, I gave him a dollar bill and it opens the door and we're on a bus and he wants to know, surely did this man just ask me how to get to heaven? And I said, wow, geez, look at what the smallest step of obedience will do. So I sure obliged and explained to him how to know for sure, beyond a shadow of a doubt, that when you die, you're going to heaven. And that's to receive Jesus Christ as your Lord and Savior in your heart, to ask him for forgiveness of your sin, to trust him as the payment for it, and that when you die, you as a new creation in Christ Jesus would go straight to heaven. And he prayed with us right there to do that very thing. Friends, this is the kind of stuff that I wish you could hear more about. I wish we had the time to take the time to do more of it. But this is my point. It, it's, you don't have to have these, these, you know, perfectly tuned and timed deals and, oh, you know, it's got to happen a certain way. Guys, we're standing there at a bus stop in Florida with a dollar bill to a perfect stranger and it opens up the question of his heart, 
how do I get to heaven when I die? This is a big guy. This is a guy who's well-traveled. He's, you know, uh, probably older than I was. You know, not, not incredibly older, but just, you know, uh, a, 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 an elder, if you will. And just one dollar opened up the door to that. And the Lord knew that that fruit was hanging right there on that tree. And if you'll be sensitive, those are the kinds of situations you can be telling your grandkids all about. You know, these 50,000 conversions that took place in your short lifetime. And, and here's what happened. Because you stayed sensitive. Because soul winning is not something you do. Soul winning is who you are. And so you don't have to get worked up to be ready to preach in season. You just are always ready. Somebody says, how do you do what you do? How do you get ready? I said, I just stay ready. Man, we, we hit go and we've gone. You know, there's no getting ready. It's just stay ready, be ready, you know. And so this is the kind of thing we're talking about. Fishing for men and build, being builders of people. So let's just jump back over into our notes here. And uh, we'll go a little bit further on our teaching. Uh, we'll recap a little bit. We talked about Galatians 4.19 that, that at least... Uh, a part of discipleship, a part of fishing for men and being builders of people, at least a part of it is travailing for them in prayer. Oh my gosh. Sorry, guys, if, if you were watching a second ago and it got cut off. Um, I've, I'm trying to keep this phone charged uh, so that the battery doesn't die down. And, and because of that, it, the phone was tilting off the computer screen here. Um, we're, you know, we're doing the best we can with what we got. But hopefully you'll, you'll recap and join us again. But let, let's recap from what we've taught in the first couple of teachings here. Galatians 4.19, uh, My Little Children of whom I travail in birth again until Christ be formed in you. I think to be a disciple maker, you're going to have to be a person of prayer. I think love in your heart for God and for people is going to drive you to your knees to pray for someone. I, I, you know, how do I know who to pray for? I guess maybe who do you think is the most jacked up person in your life? Who needs the most prayer? Who needs the most discipleship? Start right there. You know, so often we see all these problems that need to be fixed. And we never realize maybe we're the one God called us to fix that problem. Or, or maybe the reason we see so many mistakes in that person or in that situation is because God's trying to tell us without telling us, hey, why don't you pray for them? You know, why don't you pray uh, over that situation for these problems to be solved? And, and if we do that, I think we'd see so much more discipleship. I know we would grow. I know our hearts would be enlarged in Christ Jesus. And I know that these kinds of things... Um, God would, would be so pleased with. Uh, then we talked about being a fisher of men. We'll go from Galatians 4.19 to Matthew 4.19. Jesus said unto them, follow me and I will make you fishers of men. In other words, it's something you're going to become. It's not something you are right now. Uh, it's not who you are right now, but it's something you will become if you'll follow me. And then we talked about how Christ is called the way. And so Jesus was saying, as you follow me in the way that I walk, in the way that I live, because I am the way, you'll be a, a way maker in the lives of other people, which will make you a disciple maker. And so we talked about verses like Romans 3.17, 3, and the way of peace they have not known. Um, we talked about Acts 2.28, thou, thou hast made known to me the ways of life. Uh, you shall make me full of joy with thy countenance and that type of thing. Uh, then we talked about uh, you know, Christ being reproduced in us and how in Isaiah 54, 17, it says, uh, this peace uh, is the heritage of the servants of the Lord, those in whom the ideal servant of the Lord is reproduced. And so it's not just an automatic thing. You know, Christ is, is, is formed and reformed in us as we follow in him. John 15 and 7 says, if you abide in me and my words abide in you, You'll ask whatever you will uh, to the Father, and it'll be done. 
and, and that hints of discipleship, that hints of, of, of God's Word dwelling in you and you dwelling in, in God's Word. Uh, Titus 3 and 7 says, He did it in order that we might be justified by His grace, His favor wholly undeserved, that we might be acknowledged and counted as conformed to the will in purpose, thought, and action, and that we might become heirs of eternal life according to our hope. So there's a conforming, uh, there's, you know, Paul is travailing in, in, in prayer till Christ is birthed in the Galatians. Uh, Matthew 4.19, Jesus is saying, follow me, I'll make you fishers of men. And, and then we're reading here in Titus where he's saying, and then Isaiah 54.17, there's a conforming of Christ, there's a reproducing of Christ in us. Uh, it's not just we go to church, we listen to somebody speak a special thought, and then we go home and think, oh, how nice and how sweet that was. And then, okay, I'll come back next week. Be no, no. This is we're talking about evolving into Jesus Christ, mirror image here in the earth. Well, you know, I'm I'm not perfect. Well, nobody is. Paul, in fact, said this one thing I do, uh, not as though I have attained it, but I but I forget those things that are behind, and I press on up towards the call of the the, the mark of the high high call in Christ Jesus. So if Paul didn't get there, of course we're not going to. But we should never stop trying. We should never stop making that effort to become uh, more and more Christ-like in the earth. We also touched on. The fact that we can't limit our interpretation, our, our if you will, paradigm uh, as to what discipleship looks like as to only the morality and character of Christ, but though it's not exempt from that. But but I'm, I'm just to be honest with you, most sermons you hear today, 90% of them, I would dare say, are on being a more moral person. There's not anything wrong with that, except if that's all you ever hear. Because I want to tell you something. Guys, all religions tell you to be moral. All religions tell you to be good, do good deeds. Their version of being good and being moral. But there's only one faith in the earth that actually gives you the power to do it, and that's Christianity. And that power is not just a moral-making power. Uh, that power is a supernatural uh, revealing of the realm of the impossible and the miracles in the earth. That power will cause the sick to be well as you lay your hand on them in Jesus' name. That power will cause you to raise the dead uh, if you'll pray for them in faith and believing in Jesus' name. That power will cause you to bind up devils in people's lives so that they can see with their own eyes the truth, whereas those devils had their eyes blinded before. This power will cause you to love people that are absolutely not lovable. It will cause you to be who you were never before. Uh, so we don't want to limit discipleship only to the morality and only to the character of Christ, but then we don't want to leave that out either because obviously a person's gifting can take them further than their character can hold them. So we, what we want is the character to match the outflow of power in a person's life so that we get a better, more well-rounded picture of a fisher of men, a builder of people. And, and so we pray prayers like Colossians 1, 9 through 11, uh, that, that God's will, the knowledge of his will, would flood our hearts in all spiritual wisdom and understanding, that we would walk worthy of Christ, fully pleasing Him, bearing fruit in every good work, uh, and in this type of thing. Then we talked about how love and faith uh, are what really, really matters. Uh, Galatians 5 and 6, For in Jesus Christ neither circumcision avails anything nor uncircumcision, but faith which works by love. And so then we've talked about mentoring in Philippians 1 and 8. Paul says, For God is my record, how greatly I long after you all in the bowels of Jesus Christ. And, and, and there's just no way to be mentoring and loving on people if you don't have bowels of compassion, if you don't have a move of your heart towards them, if you aren't reaching in your heart and your thought towards someone, it would be very hard to mentor them. If you don't have them on your heart, if God's not able to place them in your path, even in your thought life, it would be hard to show them the right kind of love and acceptance that it would take to mentor and to build them up and to fish for them. And then we talked about uh, Hebrews 6 and 12, that we be not slothful, but followers of them, who through faith and patience inherit the promises. Uh, you know, I know that we shouldn't set our eyes on men, but the fact is God does use people. You know, God sent the Son of Man and the Son of God. And so there ought to be people around that we can find to emulate uh, the part of their life that is possessing God's promises through faith and patience. And of course, patience is an expression of love because the first fruit of love is patience. 
And so, you know, you want to look for extremely patient people uh, to follow after. You want to be an extremely patient person uh, so that you can be an effective disciple maker. Because the truth is, you know, let's say you say you win, a, win someone to the Lord that's been a drug addict, you know, or, 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 or that type of thing. Well, you know, anybody with half a brain is going to realize that a month into their Christianity, they may slip, they may fall, and then they're going to have this horrible conscious thing going on. Oh, man, you know, I, I, I prayed to ask Jesus into my heart a month ago, and now here I am, you know, doing this thing again. You've got to be patient with them and say, you know what? It's baby steps. It's a day at a time. It's a week at a time. It's a month at a time. And, and that's now when you can start to have faith like that, and you're just not so frail and fragile. Oh, no, they're going to hell now. They must have been fake. They didn't mean it. No. You know, you can be set free through an anointed prayer, but it takes the Word of God and discipleship to make you free. And there needs to be people in your life that love you no matter what. I don't mean they excuse you no matter what, but you know that they love you no matter what. You know, you've got to earn the voice of correction. You have to show this kind of love and acceptance and patience to be able to, at some point in time, uh, encourage them and nudge them in a way that it doesn't destroy their self-identity, it doesn't destroy their self-confidence. Uh, so these are some aspects of building up people and fishing for men that we need to touch on. Uh, because so often we want a McDonald's Christianity. If it's not fast and quick and now, you know, uh, you know, there's probably people, I'm not saying there's, it's possible that people are flipping through this very broadcast right now and going, ah, I don't, I don't see, you know, he's supposed to be a healer of people and these miracles and signs and wonders. And he's just sitting on a couch somewhere talking to us. Ah, I got, you know, I'll go listen, you know. See, that's the kind of thing we're talking about. That's the very thing we're talking about. That's why there's such a shallow state of Christianity in the earth today where you, you, you couldn't find supernatural in something that's not spectacular. Absolutely, God does spectacular supernatural things in our ministry. We see it happen. Bones grow out. Uh, you know, dead people get up. People with crutches, you know, are healed and all that good stuff. But it's not all bells and whistles. It's not just living event to event. There is the everyday mundane. There's the little victories and the little battles that lead up to those larger moments. And it's times like this when we can come into your living room and we can have a little talk with you and, and say, you know what? Uh, we want to build you up. We want to encourage you. We want to train you to be a builder of people. And this is some of the ways that it happens. Uh, so let's move on. We do it in prayer. We talked about Galatians 4.19. I don't think if you, if you won't pray for that person, I don't think you have a right to speak into that person's life. I don't think you have a right to correct them, maybe even encourage them. Because where you've not made an investment, uh, you, you can tend to be abusive. We always say this when we're, we're pastoring and stuff like that. It's those that give the least that, that quack the most. You know, the, the, the guy that throws a dollar on the plate every six months he usually is the loudest complainer in the whole thing. And yet those that give of their time, their talent, and their treasure are usually the most less critical. And when they did have something to say, you know they have an investment in it, you're, you're more likely to listen. Because, you know, you, we tend to not be critical of things we make investments in. And so, you know, uh, things to think about. I, make an investment in people. And that way you're not as quick to criticize them as you're training and discipling them, Scripture talks about parents don't exasperate your children to anger. It also says, children, obey your parents in the Lord, for this is honorable and right because you live a long life. Uh, but you don't, fathers, you don't want to exasperate people. And I don't just necessarily mean younger people. I, I mean, you might be mentoring people that are much physically older than you. Uh, don't exasperate them. Uh, you know, so, some extras to look at here. Uh, Colossians 3 and 3 says, you are dead, and your life is hid with Christ in God. One of my most favorite things to do in mentoring and discipleship is to get to share a testimony that most people maybe don't know, hadn't heard, some, something that took place that's reserved treasure. You know, there, there's Jesus has his 70, then Jesus had his 12, then Jesus had his 3, and then Jesus had John, you know, who let us know he was the disciple that Jesus loved. Of course, Jesus loved them all, but... He, he had his inner circle. And there's something so special about getting a chance to share with someone a, a special heart moment, uh, a, a thing, a nugget of truth, a, an insight that you know that you've not been permitted to share with a group at large or even a handful of people. But there's that one, that one moment, that one ear, and they're able to hear it. 
and it's a special gift, no, no strings attached. And here's a great mentoring, teaching moment, and, and let me bless you with this. I love those kinds of things. They, they make the, the mundane and the grit and the grime and the war, if you will, they make it worthwhile to know that, you know what, that person's going to take that and run with that. And whether I'm ever around to see it, I know that, that truth has been uh, prolonged in the earth uh, through, a, through a good teaching in someone's heart. Uh, Galatians 1 6 says, I, I marvel that you are so soon removed from him that called you into the grace of Christ and to another gospel. I think one major, major aspect of discipleship is shoring up truth in people's lives. There's so much false stuff out there. And if you spend time with people, I don't mean to be a confession police and a confession inspector and a little Hitler, a little Holy Ghost Hitler. We talked about that too. You are not the Holy Ghost. That job is taken, and there's no need to try and step in his way. We're there to admonish, we're there to encourage, we're there to lead, guide, and only when necessary, rebuke and correct. And it's something I've learned, I'm learning. You know, nobody does it perfectly except for God. Uh, but one thing that, that hopefully is happening in mentoring and discipleship is an ability to, to make sure right doctrine is being placed in a person's heart. I, I've had people come to me and say, oh, Jesus is not the only way. These are people I've pastored. Jesus is not the only way. I love Jesus. He's in my heart. But I believe everybody's going to get to go to heaven. And I'm like, wow, wow. Uh, that's absolutely not at all what the Bible teaches. But maybe now is not the time to bring that to their attention. Let me love on them a little bit more. Let me earn that trust a little bit more. Let me, you know, gather some respect here. And maybe as they start to hear on some other things, their heart will open to the fact that, you know what? Christ is the only way. And because he's the only way, that really puts a premium on our sharing our faith. I mean, that really sobers us to how wisely we use our time. Uh, because if Christ is the only way, and he is, then we better not be running around missing opportunities to share that with people who think there is some other way. Because you won't see them again after they die. They won't be in heaven with you. And, and I know we love people, and I know we want the best for people. But Jesus is the only way. He says, no man comes to the Father but by me. I am the way, the truth, and the life. And so, you know, when you're, in, you're ministering to people, you have a chance to shore things like that up. You don't always know what they believe. You don't always know where they're coming from. And, and so if you're doing a good job of staying closely connected to the head and to the truth, God will continue to, to use you to feed people and mentor people and love people. And, and he'll draw and he'll add into your life. Uh, but, you know, we, we've got to make sure that we're uh, protecting people uh, as best we can with our prayers and our lives and our insights and our teachings from seducing spirits and doctrines of devils. You know, on these college campuses nowadays, man, it, it was bad when I was there, uh, and I went to a Christian school, uh, but it took me three years to figure that out. That's how cold and lukewarm that place was. Nobody was telling me Jesus was the way, even on a Christian school. You can imagine what it's like now, 20 years later on, on secular colleges. I mean, there's all kinds of crazy stuff out there. But, you know, I've never had a demon run from the name of Buddha or Muhammad. Uh, I've never seen somebody get healed because I prayed for him in the name of Confucius. See, those things just don't work. So anyway, uh, my phone says I'm out of data. I thought I was connected to Wi-Fi. Let me wrap this up, and, and, and maybe if we do a part four here in a minute, we'll, we'll jump back in on this. But uh, let me just uh, pray for you. Lord, I just love them. I encourage them. I pray that in the name of Jesus... They rise higher than they ever have before. And we just claim this done in Jesus' name. Amen.